welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. You probably had a test recently on the material we've covered in the past few videos. I hope that went well for you. Today we'll start looking at electricity and how it plays a role in chemical reactions. It's something crucial to understand if you're interested in topics like alternative fuels and batteries. To begin, we'll revisit a topic you saw very briefly way back in the early days of General Chemistry 1. Back then, you found out that there are three general types of chemical reaction. Precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, and reduction-oxidation or redox reactions. We talked about precipitation reactions recently, back in video 26 when we talked about the solubility product constant and equilibria involving insoluble compounds. And of course we've talked about acids and bases in several videos. Now we'll delve more deeply into redox reactions. These are really interesting. They include combustion reactions and explosions, and many different kinds of biological reaction, like the ones involved with respiration and photosynthesis. As you can guess from those examples, redox reactions often release large amounts of energy, so they can be really useful when we want to develop new technologies like batteries, fuels, or solar panels. For that reason, we'll talk about redox reactions in courses you might take in the future, like physical chemistry. So what is a redox reaction? Well, remember, redox is short for reduction oxidation. So to understand these reactions, we have to understand what reduction and oxidation are. The key is to think about the charges on the atoms in the compounds that take part in the reaction. For example, here's a reaction in which calcium reacts with silicon dioxide. The products are calcium oxide and silicon. As I mentioned, in order to understand this reaction, or any redox reaction, the important thing is to know what the charge is on each of the atoms. There are a few simple rules for figuring out charges on the atoms in a molecule. The first rule is that any pure element has a charge of zero. So for example, in a pure piece of copper or iron, the atoms have a charge of zero. That's also true for diatomic elements. So, for example, nitrogen gas is a diatomic element, N2, and the nitrogen atoms, in this case, must have a charge of zero. You might remember that, in a much earlier video, I showed you that there are seven diatomic elements to know about. If you've forgotten them, now would be a good time to review that list. The second rule is that oxygen atoms in a molecule will usually have a charge of minus two. There are definitely exceptions to that rule. For example, the oxygens in hydrogen peroxide actually have a charge of minus 1 instead of minus 2. But we won't need to worry about those exceptions in this course. The third rule is that hydrogen atoms in a molecule will usually have a charge of plus 1. Again, there are a few exceptions, but you won't need to worry about them in this class. The fourth rule is that the charges on the atoms in a neutral molecule should add up to zero. You already actually know about that rule. We've used it many times to figure out the formulas of molecules. For example, the reason magnesium chloride has the formula MgCl2 is because the charges on the atoms must add up to zero. Since magnesium has a charge of plus two and chlorine is minus one, we need two chlorines to make the charges cancel out. The fifth and final rule is that in a polyatomic ion, the charges must add to give the overall charge of the ion. So for example, one of the polyatomic ions you know about is carbonate, which has a charge of minus two. So what are the charges on each atom in this ion? Well, we said a minute ago that oxygen usually has a charge of minus two. Since there are three of them, that's a total of minus six for the oxygens. What about the carbon? Well, rule five tells us that the charges on each atom must add up to the overall charge on the ion. In this case, that's minus two. So that means that the carbon must have a charge of plus four. So back to our redox reaction. Let's use the rules we just talked about to find the charge on each atom in the reaction. Rule one tells us that any pure element has a charge of zero. So the calcium on the left and the silicon on the right have a charge of zero. 
Rule 2 tells us that any oxygen in a molecule will have a charge of minus 2. So that takes care of all of our oxygens. Now for the other atoms. Rule 4 tells us that the charges on the atoms in a neutral molecule must total 0. In the case of the silicon dioxide, that means that the silicon must have a charge of plus 4 to counteract the two oxygen atoms. In the case of calcium oxide, the calcium must have a charge of plus 2. And that's it. But notice what happened in this reaction. The oxygen atoms in the reactants had a charge of minus 2, and they still had a charge of minus 2 in the products. But the calcium and silicon had their charges change. The calcium's charge increased from 0 to plus 2, and the silicon went down from plus 4 to 0. Let's think about what happened to those atoms on a really basic level. The charge on the calcium went up. There's only two ways for that to happen. First, we could have gained two protons. But we know that can't be what happened, because if an atom gains protons, it changes what the element actually is. If the calcium had gained two protons, that would have turned it into a titanium atom. That can't be right. The other possibility is that the calcium could have lost two electrons. Since the electrons have a negative charge, losing two of them would cause the charge on the calcium to go up. And that's what happened here. In the case of the silicon, the charge went from positive 4 to 0. The charge went down by 4. Again, since electrons have a negative charge, that means the silicon gained 4 electrons. This is what makes a redox reaction different from a precipitation reaction or an ordinary acid-base reaction. If you look at the precipitation or acid-base reactions we had in the previous videos, you'll see that the charges on the atoms in those reactions never changed. In a redox reaction, there will always be some elements whose charges change. So in our example, the charge on the silicon went down. We see that the silicon was reduced. Meanwhile, the charge in the calcium increased. That's called oxidation, and that's why these are called reduction oxidation, or redox reactions. Some people have a hard time remembering the difference between reduction and oxidation, so here's an easy way to keep them straight. <laughs> Leo the lion says grr. That's Leo, L-E-O, which stands for loses electrons, oxidation, and GER, G-E-R, which stands for gains electrons, reduction. So in our reaction, the calcium lost electrons, so it was oxidized, and the silicon gained electrons, so it was reduced. Let's try another example. As I mentioned earlier, combustion reactions are redox reactions. Here's the balanced reaction for the combustion of methane. What are the charges on the atoms in this reaction? Well, by rule one, any pure element has a charge of zero, and that includes diatomic elements. So the oxygens in O2 have a charge of zero. By rule two, oxygens in a molecule have a charge of minus two. So the oxygens in the CO2 and in the water have a charge of minus two. Rule three tells us that hydrogens in a molecule have a charge of plus one. So the hydrogens in the methane and the water have a charge of plus one. And last, rule four tells us that the charges on atoms in a neutral molecule must add up to zero. So the carbon in CH4 must have a charge of minus four, and the carbon in CO2 must have a charge of plus four. You can see that some of the elements had their charges change, so that makes this a redox reaction. Which element was reduced, and which was oxidized? Well, the carbon went from a charge of minus 4 to plus 4, so that tells us that it lost electrons. If you remember, Leo says grr, you'll know that since it lost electrons, the carbon was oxidized. Meanwhile, the oxygen went from a charge of 0 to minus 2, 
so it gained electrons, and that means the oxygen was reduced. Notice that in this example, the oxygen ended up in two different molecules on the product side. That doesn't change anything we just discussed. The important thing is that the charge on the oxygen went down, which is all that matters for deciding whether it was reduced or oxidized. Now that we know how to find the charges on atoms, it turns out that we can use this to balance some pretty complicated reactions. It turns out that some redox reactions can be difficult to balance if we try to do it in the usual way. For example, consider this redox reaction, in which permanganate ion and bisulfite ion react to form manganese-2 ion and sulfate. This could be a very difficult reaction to balance. One big problem is that there's a hydrogen atom on the left side, but there are none on the right. There must be some ion or molecule missing from the reaction, so it seems like we'd never be able to balance it. But fortunately, there is a method we can always use to balance redox reactions, even very tricky ones like this. It's definitely something you'll want to become comfortable with, so let's give it a try. The first step is to find the charges on all the atoms in the reaction, using the process we just learned about a few minutes ago. So, in this reaction, rule 2 tells us that all the oxygens should have a charge of minus 2. Rule 3 tells us that all the hydrogens have a charge of plus 1. Finally, rule 5 tells us that the charges on the atoms in an ion should add up to give the total charge on the ion. So, for example, the oxygens in the permanganate ion have a charge of minus 2 each for a total of minus 8. However, the ion has an overall charge of minus 1. So, the manganese must have a charge of plus 7. Meanwhile, the hydrogen in the bisulfite ion has a charge of plus 1, and the oxygens have a total charge of minus 6. The bisulfite ion has a total charge of minus 1, so that means the sulfur must be positive 4. On the product side, the manganese has a charge of plus 2. The oxygens in the sulfate have a total charge of minus 8, and the sulfate has a minus 2 charge overall, so the sulfur must be positive 6. Now that we've done that, we can see what's happening to the charges on the elements. The oxygen starts out with a charge of minus 2, and it also ends with a minus 2 charge, so nothing changes for the oxygen. However, the charge on manganese changes from plus 7 to plus 2. The charge decreased, so it must have gained electrons, and that means the manganese was reduced. Meanwhile, the charge on sulfur went from plus 4 to plus 6, so the sulfur must have lost electrons, which means the sulfur was oxidized. Now we can finish balancing the reaction. Step 2 is to split the reaction into two smaller reactions. One reaction only has the reactant and product involved in the reduction, and the other reaction only has the reactant and product involved in the oxidation. In this case, that means that we have a reduction reaction with permanganate on the left and manganese-2 ion on the right. And the other reaction is an oxidation with bisulfite ion on the left and sulfate on the right. When we split a redox reaction into two pieces like this, the two smaller reactions are called half reactions. The reason we did this is because it turns out to be much easier to balance the two half reactions separately and then recombine them later than it is to try to balance the whole reaction at once. So our next few steps involve balancing the two half reactions. In step three, we pick one of the half reactions and balance all the elements except hydrogen and oxygen, which we save for later. In this case, that's really easy. The only element aside from oxygen is the manganese, which is already balanced. The same is true for the oxidation reaction. The only element aside from oxygen and hydrogen is the sulfur, which is already balanced. Of course, we'll see other examples later where the elements aren't already balanced for us, and we'll have to do it ourselves. Next is step four, 
which tells us to pick one of the half reactions and balance the oxygens by adding water to one side of the reaction until there are equal numbers of oxygens on both sides. For instance, in our reduction reaction, there are four oxygens on the left side, so we'll add four water molecules on the right. That balances the oxygens. However, it also messed up the number of hydrogens, but we'll fix that later. Now we'll do the same thing with the oxidation reaction. There are three oxygens on the left and four on the right, so we'll balance the oxygens by adding one water molecule to the left side. Now we move on to step five, in which we'll balance the hydrogens. We pick a half reaction and balance the reaction by adding H plus ions until there are equal numbers of hydrogens on both sides of the arrow. In the reduction reaction, there are no hydrogens on the left, but there are eight on the right. That means we'll add eight H plus ions to the left side, which balances the hydrogens. In the oxidation reaction, there are three hydrogens on the left, two from the water and one from the bisulfite, and there are none on the right side of the reaction. So we'll add three H plus ions to the right side. We've now balanced all the atoms, and in a precipitation or acid-base reaction, that's all we'd have to do. But in redox reactions, we have one more thing to worry about. We've been adding hydrogen ions to our reactions, but since those ions have a charge, that means we've been changing the charge on each side of the reaction. Unfortunately, that means we've created some impossible reactions. For example, let's add up the charges on each side of the reduction reaction. There are eight H plus ions and one permanganate ion for a total charge of plus seven on the left side. On the right side, there's a manganese plus two ion and four neutral water molecules for a total charge of plus two on the right. So our reaction went from having a charge of plus seven to plus two. But that's impossible. It isn't possible to create or destroy charges during a reaction. We need to make sure that the charge is the same at the end of the reaction as it was in the beginning. That brings us to step six. If the charges on each side of a half reaction don't match, we add electrons to one side of the reaction until the charges are balanced. Electrons have a charge of negative one. So in this example, we'll add five electrons to the left side. Now the charge is plus two on both sides of the reaction. Next, we'll do the same for the oxidation reaction. There's a charge of minus one overall on the left side, and on the right side, there's a sulfate ion and three H plus ions for a total of plus one on the right side. To balance out the charges, we need to add two electrons on the right. Now there's a charge of minus one on both sides. We're almost done. There's just one more step. We're ready to recombine the two reactions to get our overall reaction back, but there's one thing we need to check first. It's not possible to have free electrons just floating around in a reaction. If you look at the two half reactions, you'll see that we have five electrons on the left side and we have two electrons on the right side in the oxidation reaction. If we were to add the reactions together now, two of the electrons would cancel out, but that would still leave three on the left side. We need to make sure that all the electrons cancel out. We can do that by multiplying each reaction by a number so that the number of electrons is the same in both reactions. In this example, we'll multiply the reduction reaction by two and the oxidation reaction by five. When we do that, we'll end up with 10 electrons in each reaction. Let's try it. For the reduction reaction, we get 10 electrons, 16 hydrogen ions, and two permanganate ions on the left side, and two manganese two ions, and eight water molecules on the right. For the oxidation reaction, we get five water molecules and five bisulfite ions on the left side, and five sulfate 
15 hydrogen ions, and 10 electrons on the right. Now we're ready to add the two half reactions back together to get our overall result. Notice what will happen when we do that. There are 10 electrons on the left of the first reaction and 10 on the right of the second reaction, so these will all cancel out. But that's not all. There are 16 hydrogen ions on the left side and 15 on the right. That means all but one of the ones on the left side will cancel out. Finally, notice that there are five water molecules on the left and eight on the right. So five of the waters will cancel out on the right side, leaving behind three. So when we add these two reactions together, we have one hydrogen ion, two permanganates, and five bisulfites on the left, and two manganese two ions, three water molecules, and five sulfates on the right. Wow, we did a lot of work to get here. This process will get much, much faster with practice. But before we stop, we should probably check our answer. It's very easy to make a mistake when balancing redox reactions, so it's a good idea to make sure that everything balances when you're done. I highly recommend that you do this. Just remember, in a redox reaction, both the elements and the charges need to balance. So let's check these for this reaction. I'll check the charges first. There's one H plus ion, two permanganates, and five bisulfites on the left for a total charge of minus six. On the right, there are two manganese two ions, five sulfates, and three neutral water molecules for a total of minus six. That's the same as on the left side, so the charges balance. So far, so good. Now we'll check the elements. There are a total of six hydrogens on the left and six on the right, so those look good. There are two manganese atoms on both sides and five sulfurs on both sides. For the oxygens, there are a total of eight in the permanganates and 15 from the bisulfites for a total of 23 on the left side. On the right, there are 20 from the sulfate ions and three from the water for a total of 23, the same as on the left side. That means that all the elements balance, so our overall reaction is correct. As you can tell, balancing redox reactions can take some time, so we'll get more practice doing that in the next video and in class and on the homework. Redox reactions are some of the most exothermic reactions possible, which means they're very useful for fuel and energy applications, so it's definitely worth getting good at understanding redox reactions. But that's enough new material for now. We'll see more next time, so I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!